this content is for kids. It's not for kids. No, isn't that what I said? No, it's not for kids. If oh. you are 13 years or younger, no. this is not for you. <laughs> Do I have to kill somebody in order to actually make that point across? No, man, you don't have to kill Wait no a one. second. Oh, no, 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 no. If we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture. Greetings! <laughs> You're watching Septum Sin vs. the World. I'm Septum Sin. This is Kotobuki Jake. Hi. We're here with one of two Oscar lists that we are going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And because we're deciding to do two different things, we would normally divide this into two different videos. Mm -hmm. But we're going to combine this into one long video. Mm -hmm. So I hope you're ready because it's going to be a long and bumpy ride. Now we are going to try to make it an entertaining one and hopefully a quick one. <laughs> but <clears throat> the basic, uh, the first thing we're going to do here is, of course, we saw the Oscar nominations come out last week. And uh, every year, mm -hmm. us film geeks get worked into a rage over all the stuff that got snubbed. <laughs> horribly, horribly snubbed. And there were some pretty egregious snubs this year. There were no survivors. <laughs> there were no, yes. Um, and one category, well, one group of categories that most people get really worked up about, because most people really pay attention to these, are the acting categories. And I thought it would be interesting to look at the history of snubs in the acting categories. And let's just say there's a lot. There's a lot of people who have been overlooked come nomination day in the history of the Oscars. Some were, when you look back on it now, you're like, the hell you say? They weren't nominated? And some, you're kind of like, yeah, I guess in the benefit of hindsight, I can <laughs> see it. But the thing is, I was brainstorming, brainstorming, brainstorming. I came up with so many names that could have been seen as snubs. So, this is going to have to be a semi-regular feature. I'm thinking maybe every other year, maybe. Because uh, last year we did a couple good ones that we could maybe do next year. Kind of alternate, maybe. That would be good. Um, because some of these are really big <laughs> categories. <laughs> but... I wanted to, to to like take some time to uh, take some give a little shout out to some of the yeah. people that got overlooked. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it. I am enjoying this scene. Get on with it. And I'm gonna go ahead and cheat and lead us off with an example. And this will be cross-referencing with this week's Inside Movies Galore discussion. So, a little bit of promotion for that uh, discussion while we're at it. Uh. One of the most famous snubs of the past 20 years, and arguably one of the more egregious ones, was leaving out Paul Giamatti for Best Actor for Sideways. No, sir, I don't like it. He was heavily, heavily talked up. He was up for the Golden Globe. The, he won the Independent Spirit Award. Mm. He had 18 additional wins and 16 <coughs> additional nominations. Many of these ensemble with the rest of the cast, yeah. but still, you know, but this role is Miles uh, Raymond. Oh, you had you had a picture of him on there. I forgot to bring that 
Well, so, you get to see him on the. On yeah, the cover that's why there. I show you the cover there. <laughs> Technically, Sandra O oh was a minor snub too, and I won't even go go into the BS of calling him a supporting actor in this film, but that's an example, one of the most egregious ones. Granted, it was the year that Jamie Foxx was going to win for Ray. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was going to win. There was no two ways about it. But Clint Eastwood for Million Dollar Baby, Don Cheadle for Hotel Rwanda, Johnny Depp for Finding Neverland, any one of them could have stepped aside. (laughs) I do think Leo DiCaprio's one for Aviator was a pretty good one. But... Like I said, I just wanted to lead off with that as an example. This is because, you know, this was one of the most famous of the bunch. And also, again, to promote our discussion, we're doing second chances on Inside Movies Galore. He hated Sideways the first time he saw it. So we're going to start this month with a discussion of Sideways. (laughs) That would have been interesting when I I did research into it that, you know, George Clooney was going to be playing the part that... Jack, uh, yeah, the Mike Thomas Hayden Church. Yeah. You know, actually, I think that it would have been better with that. I don't know. That George Clooney is such a... It's much more charismatic. Well, he is, but that's kind of... uh, Part of the point was he was a little bit goofy, huh. but um, anyway, since I kind of did that, if you want, do you want to go ahead and start the actual list, or do you want? Oh, um, I can. Okay, I go have, for that. Uh, so I went a little bit differently as because both mm-hmm. of us have different kind of tastes into that. Right. And since there was no stipulation <laughs> that it had to be something that Oscar actually would choose, it had to be eligible. Eligible, as in the film was a film at that year but i'm talking about snobbery oh yeah well snobbery is a big part of this yeah yes yeah i got a couple in there there's only (laughs) one on the item on this list that might not would not have been eligible by their rules because it was a foreign feature did it screen in la county during the calendar year now that i don't know because that is but we'll but we'll get into it when we but get yeah to it. we'll get to it and uh but that's the only one i think that's not uh that would not be in that right but some of these movies would not be eligible for the oscars because right the oscar would never consider these things right they'd be eligible but yeah good luck <laughs> so the first one though is a given hmm. i think like i said you'll agree with some of these you'll disagree with others yeah so, the first one is Tim Robbins for his role as Jacob in the 1990 film Jacob's Ladder. Hmm. As you, and yes, this did get into theaters. Yeah. And it had zero award nominations hmm. and zero wins. I mean, the film, none. No award nominations at all? At least IMDb says none. Wow. So, who won? And of course, I had to remind myself, it's the 1991 award show for that. So, Jeremy Irons won that year for Reversal of Fortune. Right. Also, Kevin Costner for Dances with Wolves was nominated. Robert De Niro for Awakenings. Okay. Gerard Depardieu for Cerno de Bergerac. Okay. And Richard Harris for The Field. Huh. The problem, of course, is I've never seen The Field so I, I couldn't either. tell you whether Richard Harris deserved that nomination, but Tim Robbins was excellent in this film. His portrayal of an individual going through PTSD and mm-hmm. the potential, the potential purgatory, mm-hmm. which may or may not have been literal purgatory, if you really read read mm-hmm. uh, the background and all that stuff, it just was to me a very strong mm-hmm. portrayal that should not have been ignored and was sadly ignored by what looks to be everybody <laughs> so uh my hope is that when they do it again mm-hmm. and they're rebooting it in 2000 uh, they've rebooted it mm. maybe this time we'll see something different now of those people you did see is there one you would knock off the list in favor of robbins i didn't think robert de niro deserved as much for awakening really hmm. uh, but that's just me Kevin Costner, I feel like that was probably one of his strongest roles was yeah. the Dances with Wolves, so I couldn't really go with that. And I haven't seen Reversal of Fortune, so I, I can't need really. to see Reversal of Fortune. That's pretty bad. Uh, and I mean, Jepar- I mean, Gerard Depardieu. I mean, I can't really. He was good in Cyrano. Yeah, like Bush. I said, I can't really he's, say that he's uh, that, he was, that he didn't deserve it. That's yeah. the reason why. Okay, 
So, okay, so a little bit more clarification real quick. I probably should have specificated that we had to make sure they were Oscar eligible. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, um, I went, these were some of my criteria. I tried to hit a few of the ones like this that were gimmies, that everyone was like, mm -hmm. how were they missed? But a few of mine are a little different. The, like, a couple of them were heavily lauded at the time. A couple of them are ones where people looking back go, how were they missed? But they were missed at the time. No one paid attention at the time. And a couple of them are really deep cuts. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I tried to go for a blend of the, yep. uh, you know, so I don't know if you went. Well, you see, the... for mine, it's it's two. One, I'm not sure if it had, if it had a whole week of uh, filming because it's a very small film. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, well, like I say, well, we'll get to that next. Well, it's easy to see on IMDb. If you look it up and it has a yeah. premiere date, USA, or again. a premiere date, Los Angeles. Like I say, too late for me to change course right. now. <laughs> right. Well, we can always hope that some of these were... Uh, but my first one is one of the ones that you would agree was mm -hmm. pure snobbery. This is one of those ones that, in the benefit of hindsight... And incidentally, I do have a couple here that we have already discussed on Movies Galore. And that's what this one is. And this one is from the 1993 year, 1994 awards... And it is the for the role of weatherman Phil Connors in Groundhog Day, Bill Murray. Oh, yeah. Which, here's your picture right here. <laughs> uh, so, Bill Murray is, basically plays a very cynical big city weatherman who is sent to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania to cover the Groundhog Day celebrations with the groundhog, who's also called Phil, Punxsutawney mm -hmm. Phil. And he goes there with his producer, played by Andy McDowell, and his cameraman, played by Chris Elliott. And the two of them are all about it. And he wants nothing more than to leave. But a freak snowstorm traps him in town with nowhere to go. And he has to live the same day over and over and over and over again. And starts every day, one of the best uses of music in movie history with uh, Sonny and Cher's I Want You Babe waking him up every God. morning. Every morning. And he goes through it all. He goes through paranoia. He goes through depression. He goes through despair. He kills himself multiple times mm -hmm. only to wake up again and again and again until finally... He starts learning to enjoy it and try to give back, try to be a good people person. He starts, he becomes the, the hero of Puxatani, <laughs> pretty much, and it earns our love of his producer. And it is a film that apparently Bill Murray really wanted to be a deep philosophical statement. And Harold Ramis wanted to make yet another classic comedy. And the two of them were at such loggerheads, they stopped speaking for over 20 years. They were buds. And they basically stopped speaking over this movie. But they did make peace before Ramis' death, so that was yes. good. But this is a classic that was not lauded properly in its time murray himself was nominated for the saturn award and he had three additional nominations in a year that saw tom hanks winning for philadelphia and nominations of anthony hopkins for the remains of the day daniel day lewis for in the name of the father lawrence fishburne for what's Lo love got to do with it and liam neeson for schindler's list now, I hate to admit it, the only two I've seen there are Philadelphia and Schindler's List. So I'm not sure who needed to get the boot, because it sure as hell wasn't Tom Hanks and Liam Neeson. <laughs> but Bill Murray should have been on that list. So, yeah, it was a pretty unfortunate snub. And the movie overall was very unfortunately snubbed. And it was tough for me. Murray has a couple of snubs. He only has one Oscar nomination. 
And there's at least two other roles that he could and should have been up for. Maybe next time we'll do this, we'll talk about another one. <laughs> well, I have an alternate for my uh, for okay. my one, but I'm going to be talking about it anyway Go because it. it deserves it. Go for but it. That'll be later. Okay. This one is going to be a uh, potential because I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it did get a week screening in mm -hmm. L.A. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about the 1985 film Ron. Oh yeah, that was that played. But out. Oscar rules are different when it comes to foreign. Films. Well, the foreign language category is different, but it is eligible in the other categories if it got an L.A. screen. Again, but if we're talking about snub-wise, Oscar tends to be very... about, we'll come about you know, acting and so on. They've we'll come back better. to that later. But uh, Tetsuyo Naka Nakadai, uh -huh. uh, playing Lord Hide Hidetoro, mm -hmm. Hidetora Ichimonji, Mm -hmm. for the film Ron by Kira Kurosawa. It is an amazing film. Mm -hmm. And this did get some Oscar love, don't get me wrong. This is my Blu-ray edition mm -hmm. of it. You've got the actual Criterion edition, which is nice. Yes, on um, DVD, sadly. <laughs> it had four nominations uh, and one win when it came to Oscars. It uh, was nom. It was. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what it was nominated for, but it wasn't for the acting because it's all about the actor. Right. Uh, the film had thirty wins and twenty-two nominations, but none specifically for him. Hmm. So again, but so I he got like, no nominations at all, according to what I've read on IMDb. Oh. Hmm. I went through all their lists. I had to write a whole ton of notes on these things. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two areas where IMDb is a little bit less than perfect. One is, foreign is definitely. they don't have all the foreign uh, uh, organizations, mm -hmm. and they don't have all the festival stuff listed as well. They have the big festivals, but not all of them. Like, I don't think there's anything from the Virginia Film Festival yeah. on there. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this one was in the year that uh, William Hurt was up for Kiss of the Spider Woman. Mm-hmm. Which I did not agree with that win, by the way. I've not seen it. Uh, Harrison Ford for The Witness. Also didn't really agree with that, but I don't agree with many of Harrison <laughs> Ford's nominations. He hasn't uh, had many. Yeah. James Garner for Murphy's Romance. Hmm. I haven't seen it, so I can't I tell you. I haven't seen that either. Jack Nicholson for Paris Parisi's Honor. Yeah. Yeah, so so, but it's Jack yeah. Nicholson for the most part. Yeah. Um, and John Voight for Runaway Train. I haven't seen that one either. Wow, so I've seen one and a half of those movies. So, you know, I still feel like that could have uh, easily muscled its way in. Uh -huh. To me, it's an iconic performance. It's Shakespearean. Mm -hmm. Well, it is Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, it just, to me, it was an excellent performance. It's was, something that the Oscars, I feel like, overlooked. Was that the Lear role? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that was a good performance. So, you know, to me, it was deserving. Yeah. There's the old man. I think that's right, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because this is the Japanese yeah, version of King, King Lear. Lear. Yeah. And uh, it, it was, first off, it's an excellent film in and of mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And also, it just is so deserving of mm -hmm. the win. Right. All right. All right. My next one was, kind of like Paul Giamatti, a big surprise for a lot of people and a very... I believe, if I recall correctly, one of the reasons for the hashtag Oscar So White. <laughs> and that was for playing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Selma, David Oyelowo. Ah, yes. In Selma. Oh, yeah, that one was the best yeah. song. <laughs> the, it did win best song. Yeah, and it's it was a, a good song. song. Oh, yeah, it's a good it's song. song. <laughs> I rewatched this film the other night, and this was a really good movie. And it had two nominations, Best Picture and Original Song. And what's wrong with that picture? And the two most, most widely held snubs were Oyeloyo for Actor and Ava DuVernay for Director. People thought that they really, the film was horribly snubbed in both cases. Oyeloyo gives a great performance. He is a Brit, but he did a very credible Southern accent. He did a very credible impersonation of Dr. King. 
But he also just acted well. He did a really good job with the more dramatic parts, with the little bits of comedy sprinkled in. He did a really good job covering all the beats he needed to cover. He was an impressive orator in the multiple oratory yeah. scenes. And the acting overall was really impressive. Carmen and Jogos, his wife, Coretta Scott King, did a great job too. And there were uh, several other people who could have been considered yeah. here and there. And there was even one dude, I don't remember the actor, unfortunately, but the young boy who was killed during a protest, and Dr. King gives his, his uh, eulogy, the kid's father has one particular scene that's show-stopping. But it's a good example of why we need an award for best bit player or cameo. Mm. But we're focusing on the awards that do exist. Yeah. But even so, they they could have given this some love for the acting. They really should have. And let's look at this. Gold Oyelowo was nominated for the Golden Globe. He was nominated for the Independent Spirit Award. He had nine wins for the role and 16 additional nominations. So he was not a lightweight. He went in as one of the favored to get it. The award ultimately went to Eddie Redmayne for the Theory of Everything. And the other people in the field were Benedict Cumberbatch for The Imitation Game, Bradley Cooper for American Sniper, Michael Keaton for Birdman or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, who actually, it was a little bit of a shocker that he didn't win, and Steve Carell for Foxcatcher. Now, I've seen all five of those films. All five of those dudes gave pretty impressive performances. They were all great. But, Oyelowo could easily <laughs> have taken either the Bradley Cooper nod or the Steve Carell not. Easily trumped both of their performances. So it was pretty friggin' stupid that he didn't get the final cut. Especially yeah. since it was the Cooper's third nomination in a row. The dude's a great actor, but he's not that great. <laughs> it, it People should be like phenomenal to get three in a row. And I'm sorry, Cooper didn't do it. I thought his first one, Silver Linings Playbook, was his best of the three. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah. You know, I know I'm going to get a lot of American Sniper fans hating on me for this, but I'm sorry, he was much better in both of the David Russell films he was nominated <laughs> for. But, anyway... Yeah. So, um, this is a film that will probably be controversial on this. Mm -hmm. um, a film that didn't get a lot of love. I mean, it uh, got nominated for the Golden Trailer Awards, uh, Golden <laughs> Fleece winner. Wow. And, uh, and had a winner for the uh, Yoga Awards uh, for Worst Foreign Actress, Nicole Kidman. Oh, for a minute there, I thought you were talking about yoga hosers. <laughs> um, and, but I'm not talking about Nicole Kidman's uh, uh -huh. role. I'm actually talking about Robert Downey Jr. Huh? In the film Fur, an imaginary portrait oh. of Diane Arbus. I never saw that. Now, um, I wanted to make sure I got the full thing, because I had the two wins, but I didn't show for right. what. And I do have that. And, of course, Robert Downey Jr. plays this person who has this uh, disability where... He, he grows hair for all of his body hmm. and uh, he's kind of a recluse and uh, Nicole Kidman kind of comes in and uh, forms this relationship with him. Mm -hmm. It's a very good role. I think that uh, Robert Downey Jr. did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. It was 2006 so I think it's after it's after Iron Man I believe. Iron Man no, 06 would have been before Iron Man. Okay so I know why he was snubbed. Yeah. Because really and truly, Robert Downey Jr. was kind of persona non grata during that time. No, he, it was mostly he the was late. It, it was mostly the late nineties. Yeah. It was around oh six. He would have probably been well, building his career. A back, couple yeah. years after Ally McBeal, he got a lot of buzz for that. And yeah, but um, during that year, uh, of course, we had Forrest Whitaker winning for the Last King of Scotland. There mm -hmm. was no beating that. Oh, that was a great role. 
Leonardo DiCaprio for Blood Diamonds. Hmm. Mm, whatever. Uh, uh, Ryan Gosling for Half Nelson. I haven't seen Still Half Nelson. Don't need to see that. Peter O'Toole for Venus. I need to see that. That was one. a good performance. And Will Smith for Pursuit of Happiness. Now, that one to mm. me was the person to beat at the time mm. when it came to versus Forrest Whitaker because those were two pretty good roles. Matter of fact, they were. Uh, that was probably Pursuit one of the. Pursuit of Happiness was a pretty good role. Yeah. Forrest Whitaker was a kick ass role. <laughs> it was probably, though, was one of the less Will Smith, Will Smith yes. characters. Yes. And that's pretty impressive for Will Smith. Yes. Because Will Smith typically does Will Smith. As yeah, <laughs> for his characters. Uh, but still, I think that he had the potential. Mm -hmm. Many people probably would disagree with me on that, but mm -hmm. I still felt like it was a good role. He did an excellent job with the part, and it was uh, one worth mentioning because most people don't mm -hmm. know that movie, and most people don't think about that film. I don't know for um... I didn't even know the movie. I got it on a random lot. I mm -hmm. was actually lucky on that end. I knew of it, but that's it. Okay, so my next one, you're talking about deep cuts. My next one's a deep cut, and this is also a, uh, a controversial one. This one actually got the main actress blacklisted in China for a while. Um, that's how controversial it was. Um, some people, quite a fair number of people at this point, are familiar with the name Ang Lee. And Ang Lee has done a lot of really good films. And he has done some less well-received films. No one saw his movie this year, The Gemini Man. It's talking about your Will yeah. Smith movies. But uh, uh, no one really hated on it the way they did Hulk. It's kind of like another one that no one saw has become considered a bit of a classic since then called Ride with the Devil. Um, but one of the films no one saw was because he followed up his Oscar triumphing film, or nearly so, except for the very controversial win by Crash, of Brokeback Mountain, with a film where he went back home to China, and uh, technically Taiwan, that's where he's from, and he did a period piece set in China during the Japanese occupation uh, during World War II, or thereabouts, and he uh, did a little film called Seiji, or Lust Caution. <laughs> and the star of the film, Wei Tang, shown here, Wei Tang should have been, big time, should have been a nominee for Best Actress for playing Wong Chia Chi, uh, or Miss Mac. Um, this was 2007. Uh, basically, the gist of it, this is based, I believe, on a novel. Um, in Lust Caution, uh, Tang plays a, a, a Chinese student who is, um, finds that she enjoys acting and is recruited by a ragtag team of students to infiltrate a group of Japanese sympathizers. Uh, Joan Chen uh, plays a character who hosts this Mahjong game. And one of them, I think it's her husband, is played by Tony Leung. And I'm just going to go ahead and say that both Joan Chen and Tony Leung are overdue for Oscar love. But, and particularly they were great in this film. But Tan plays this beautifully, plays the role of this person who, you know, she enters the Mahjong game, she ingratiates herself to all these sympathizers to get close to the husband. Before she is really, truly able to finish her mission, mm -hmm. things happen and everyone is sent scattering to the winds. Several years later, she has another opportunity this time, the, the group is with the actual resistance. They're more organized, and she goes at it again. The film is notable, and this may have been got, what her, got her blacklisted for a while. It has an extremely graphic sex scene between Tang and Tony Leung hmm. that's violent. Let's hmm. put it that way. It's not exactly a rape scene, but it is violent. Hmm. But... Other than that, the film features top-notch production design, direction, acting, 
everything is everything we expect from Ang Lee, but no one saw the damn movie. <laughs> and it had almost no Oscar love. Tongue was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. She had, in addition to this, four wins and ten nominations for the role. And then, like I said, her career pretty much went on the skids for a while. She has worked since then, but not heavily. In the last few years, I think there's been a little bit of a steamrolling effect. She may eventually get to a point of, of overcoming the damage to her career that this film did but she really should have gotten more because she is phenomenal in this film absolutely phenomenal and so like I said that's one of my deeper cuts but that's one that really should have gotten Oscar's attention <laughs> uh, so this is one that did not qualify for the list oh. but I found out uh, well now uh, that uh, I didn't, uh, this didn't fit. So I'm going to cover this anyway because I do feel strongly about okay. this. I'm going to then sub in the one because I almost had it all down because I almost chose it. Okay. So I've got so it sitting there. If you're going to do a two for, let me just real quick, I forgot one little bit that I meant to do. When we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture, to torture, to torture, to torture. Which was the year, this could have been a good opportunity to have some major foreign uh, representation, because this was for 07. The winner that year was Marion Cotillard for her Edith Piaf biopic La Vie en Rose, which was a great performance and a great movie. But these are the other nominees. Kate Blanchett for Elizabeth the Golden Age, Ellen Page for Juno, Julie Christie for Away From Her, and Laura Linney for The Savages. I am not going to knock Ellen Page for Juno. I love that film. I love her yeah. performance. She... No. Kate Blanchett made history as the first woman nominated twice for playing the same part. But I'm sorry, whereas Elizabeth was a great film... Elizabeth, The Golden Age was a good film that really didn't really need to be there. And I love Kate Blanchett, but I think she could have given up her part. And Laura Linney in Savages was pretty much Laura Linney having a really good day acting. Which is great, but not transformative. So I think either Blanchett or Linney should have given up their role for Miss Tang. But anyway, there we go. <laughs> so this first one is just... Uh just more of a strong thought. Right. Which it could have had a week long theatrical screening, but it wouldn't mm -hmm. be at the theaters that <laughs> Oscar would have probably said were appropriate. And that would be The Dark Days of Demetrius Kane, Dakota ah. Ray. I think that his performance had more intensity, mm. a dark, intense, emotional performance. That in my in my opinion deserved that kind of love during that year, which is this year, hmm. it would have gone up against Antonio Banderas for Pain and Glory, which I still haven't seen yet. Leonardo DiCaprio for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I feel like was just them throwing the award at him, uh, as far as the nomination. Here, take it. <laughs> Here, take this nomination. I really didn't feel like it was. Uh, there were many more I felt more deserving mm. of the best actor nod. Uh, Adam Driver for Marriage Story, same thing. I felt like it was good, but I didn't feel like it was as good. Mm. Uh, not as good as uh, Scarlett Johansson's role in that, mm. anyway. Um, Joaquin Phoenix for Joker, can't really take that. <laughs> and same with Jonathan Price uh, for Two Popes. <laughs> but I do feel like it would have been a good role. And I do feel like if, if the Oscars did look at all film mm -hmm. as a category not just you know those films that make their cuts mm -hmm. I think shot on shot on video film it really does deserve that love that's enough of my soapbox Good so times. on with the real one no. uh, Jim Carrey for number 23 ah uh, yes now but really I, that's a random one now to me I felt like a dark role should mm -hmm. be through a dark role mm -hmm. and this was probably one of the darkest roles he played not and he did he, do, he did do a good job it was a very intense role and he mm -hmm. really got snubbed for it overall I, I don't know why Jim I'm looking at there <laughs> 
Jim Carrey is Oscar's fam- favorite, one of their most favorite whipping posts. So, looking at that, I mean, it did get some nominations. Mm-hmm. It, he was nominated for Worst Actor <laughs> for the Razzies. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, Teen Choice Award, uh, that did have two of those. And uh, he actually was nominated for that. Hmm. Um, it got a Soundtrack Award nomination and a uh, Taurus Award nominee uh, for Best High Work. So, again, uh, you know, I disagree with Worst Actor. I actually thought he did an excellent job yeah. of an individual slipping into madness. And, again, for Jim Carrey, back at that time, mm-hmm. this was 2007, mm-hmm. he had had his stint away from Ace Ventura. He'd mm-hmm. already done Truman Show, which was also yeah. overlooked quite a bit. Uh, and several other roles that were I really badly... I can think of three that were pretty definite snubs. So, but still, I felt like this was a good, dark, sinister mm-hmm. role for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, that year, Daniel Day-Lewis won for There Will Be Blood, which is kind of contentious of that year. Uh... George Clooney uh, for Michael Clayton, Johnny Depp for Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barber of Fleet Street. I really felt like that wasn't quite... Uh, it was a fun role. It was a fun role. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones for In the Valley of Eli. I still need to see that. I haven't seen it. Or Vigo Mortensen for Eastern Promises, which mm. was a pretty good role. Yeah. But yeah, I thought like he deserved more mm-hmm. for what he got. Mm-hmm. I thought it was an excellent job of acting. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I really didn't think it was Razzie not uh, worthy. No. And apparently it wasn't because he didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. He was right. too good for the Razzies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I could see him being one of the people that would show up to gleefully accept it. Yes. Though, so that would be great. So anyway, um, my next one, speaking of people going dark, <laughs> this, but this is, dark comedy so there we go this is gallows humor but uh and also ribald humor at the same time which is kind of fun anyway this is the most recent one on my list i made a point of trying not to go too super recent because you've heard us complain a lot already on this channel about snubs in the last couple years but this one was such an egregious snub i had to talk about it and that is for the role of Wade Wilson, a.k.a. Deadpool, <laughs> in the film Deadpool, uh, Ryan Reynolds. Ryan Reynolds was born to play this role. He really was. And I don't care what you think about superhero films in general, superhero yeah. films as they're made by Fox, <laughs> superhero films that are about a wisecracking murderer who rides unicorn kitties and shoots (laughs) 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 Ryan Reynolds was born to play that role and he plays it to the hilt not to mention Oscar loves a good comeback story and you don't have a much better comeback story for this character than the one from X-Men Origins Wolverine (laughs) Terrifying, <laughs> yes. bad. <laughs> yes, and you know, one could put Deadpool two in the conversation too, but really, the first one was the one that established the character and really established what it was supposed to be. Shoot the ad campaign for it. The ad campaign. <laughs> if uh, there should be an Oscar for best marketing, if there was, Deadpool would have wo- or should have won. The film also should have been out for <laughs> costume design. But uh, so okay, so Reynolds won the Saturn Award for the role. He was nominated for the Golden Globe, which was actually fairly impressive. He had an additional five wins and ten nominations for this role. So it would not have been an out-of-the-blue nomination. It actually had... Now, this year was the year that Casey Affleck had a slightly contentious win for Manchester by the Sea. The other nominations were Andrew Garfield for Hacksaw Ridge, Denzel Washington for Fences, Ryan Gosling for La La Land, and Viggo Mortensen for Captain Fantastic. All of those were solid performances. They were all good films. As much as I loved La La Land, 
I honestly mm. think Gosling could have easily given that nomination up for Ryan Reynolds. Mm. The others, eh, hit or miss, maybe Andrew Garfield or Denzel could have made room. They were both really good in their films. They've both done as good or better work. But, and while I don't think Casey Affleck should have won, yeah. I cannot contend his nomination. But Ryan Reynolds should have been at that party. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll admit. If if Casey Affleck had been just one year later, yeah. he would not have gotten the nomination. Probably. Because of Me Too. And uh, and yet he still won while all that stuff was flying all around him. I don't get it. Yeah. But, you know, some people. Yeah. All right. Well, this one is one that I know you'll be like, <laughs> but it does meet your criteria. Oh. <laughs> they, as a matter of fact, all the rest of these do meet your criteria. Okay, good deal. So, of course, I'm talking about the late Sid Haig. Mm -hmm. He did an excellent role as a clown, a jolly clown, in a slightly less jolly film called House of a Thousand Corpses, Ugh. where he played the role of Captain Spaulding. Ugh. Now... Say what you will about the film itself. His role, which would be a supporting actor role, mm -hmm. was really good. He came across just, I mean, to me, he was the star of the show. Mm -hmm. He was a wisecracking character. He probably was the least, uh, least evil of mm -hmm. the uh, people in that particular mm -hmm. franchise. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, on top of that, uh, in the DVD, it's it's great. The menus are hilarious. <laughs> the menus are genuinely hilarious with that. It re he really was a good actor, and he did do a good job with what he did. It was a wonderful role. Mm -hmm. Horror is extremely overlooked right. when it comes to the Oscars, unless it's super artsy horror, like, uh, say, the uh, Rosemary's Baby, good example. Uh, but let's talk about what it did do. It did have four wins, the film did, and eight nominations. And he actually won an acting award uh, through the Fangoria Chainsaw Award. Nice. For playing the role. Hmm. So that year in 2003, so 2004 Oscars, mm -hmm. uh, the um, Supporting Actor Award went to Tim Robbins. We mm. talked about him earlier right. for Mystic River, right. which was a good role. Yeah. Uh, of course, the nominees were Alec Baldwin for The Cooler. Well, I haven't seen it, so I can't yeah. say. Benicio Del Toro for 21 Grams. Can't mm. deny that. That was a good yeah. role. Uh, Dijimon, Dijimon. Dijimon, uh Hun, Hunsen, Hunsu for In America. I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. And Ken Watanabe for The Last Samurai. I have not seen that either. You haven't? No. I've seen all of those, and I will admit they're all excellent performances, but... Uh, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Alec Baldwin was Alec Baldwin doing a better than I, usual job. To me, it's another soapbox yeah. for me, because I do feel like horror and superhero movies, though the superhero yeah. movies are getting more of their due, more uh, are ones that have been routinely looked away. Right. Yet, horror in theory... Mm -hmm. Every horror movie that comes out that's not like the shot mm -hmm. on video mm -hmm. does fit the criteria for an Oscar. Yeah. And House of a Thousand Corpses, <laughs> there's a cat behind the camera. Um, he's doing all the filming, you see. Yes. Uh, any case, uh, oh. horror is there, and this was a role. This was a genuinely that good remi That role. reminds me. Uh, when we were watching Sideways, I saw there's a there is a role... That there is not an Oscar for that there needs to be an Oscar for. Mm -hmm. In in the film credits for Sideways, they they credit Lulu for the uh, role of production cat. Ah yes yes, <laughs> best animal on film. There yes. you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so are we ready? Yeah. All right, so another thing that famously is often overlooked come Oscar time. Often quite egregiously so, and this film was very egregiously overlooked. 
I think a lot of people would agree on that, should have at least gotten a freaking screenplay nod for his role as Jeffrey the Dude Lebowski in The Big Lebowski. <laughs> Jeff Bridges really should have had an Oscar nomination. I almost he, did that one. <laughs> I almost did a two for uh, John Goodman for S Walter Sobchak. He might make a future one. Just, but the dude is such an iconic role. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And it's such a... It has become the defining role of Jeff Bridges' career. He has had several Oscar nominations and one for Crazy Heart. He does have some Oscar love, but he didn't get so much as a nod for the dude. And, it, and he really got very little overall. Three nominations total. This film was totally unappreciated when it came out. And, you know, basically playing the ultimate slacker. That's pretty much it. Yeah. He's like the ultimate slacker who, when a couple of heavies come by to shake him down for money that another Jeff Lebowski owes them, and a dude pisses on his rug... And it really tied the room together. And he goes on a quest <laughs> to get a replacement rug and gets drawn into kidnapping and extortion and bowling and extensive cursing and a weird porno dream sequence with a Kenny Rogers soundtrack. The film is just brilliant. And the dude should have been an Oscar-nominated role, especially because that was the year that Roberto Benigni won for Life is Beautiful. I love Life is Beautiful. Benigni does a great job, but no, he was not better than the dude. And what's up more, we had Edward Norton for American History X. His performance as Derek Vineyard. Definitely better than Benigni's performance. Ian McKellen gave a brilliant performance in Gods and Monsters. Nick Nolte was at the top of his game for Affliction. And Tom Hanks got a wonderfully deserved nod for Saving Private Ryan. Honestly, Norton and McKellen are probably the only two that were better than Jeff Bridges. And that's debatable. <coughs> This is one of those iconic roles that was 100% Oscar worthy and they turned their nose up at it because it was a stoner comedy. So, yeah. Well, this next one focuses on something that is closer to my heart, which is mental illness. Mm. I work in the field. <laughs> <laughs> And I've actually, but and I've seen many roles that have been portrayed very well. Mm -hmm. I could not put a beautiful mind on there because even though Russell Crowe should have won that award, mm -hmm. he was nominated and therefore can't make the list. Mm. So instead, we're going to go back to Mr. Jamie Foxx, mm. who played the role of Nathaniel Ayers in the 2009 oh. film. The solo. That was a good movie. This was an incredible movie mm -hmm. and an incredible role. Jamie mm -hmm. Foxx is an amazing actor, mm -hmm. and I felt like he was snubbed over this role. The whole movie was snubbed. The Ooh. movie only got one award win <laughs> and three nominations. Mm -hmm. Now, two of those, I mean, one of those wins was Jamie Foxx winning a Prism Award, mm -hmm. and he did get nominated for the Black Reel Awards. Mm. So you know, one, so it, so he did get the film. It's one win, mm. but still, during that year, of course, Jeff Bridges won for Crazy Heart. Mm. It was a good role, mm -hmm. uh, debatable as to whether it was the winning role, but it was a good role. Mm -hmm. George Clooney for Up in the Air. I'm sorry, but Jamie Foxx was much better than George Clooney in Up in the Air. Uh, Colin Firth for A Single Man. Mm -hmm. I can give that to him on that. Mm -hmm. Morgan Freeman for Invictus. Again, I mean, Morgan Freeman is a strong actor, but and Invictus the, was not a strong film. 
with the performance was. And the um, there are those who would say he was born to play Nelson Mandela, and he did a yeah, good he job. Yeah, he did a good it. job with it. Mm-hmm. Then Jeremy Renner for The Hurt Locker. Mm-hmm. The Hurt Locker got a lot of love that year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, again, I can't really take it from him, but I still feel Jamie Foxx's role in The Soloist was superior to most of these. Mm. If not, maybe not as superior to Jeff Bridges, but definitely on par, if not better, mm. than the rest of the nominees. And should have mm-hmm. taken home the win. If not nomination, at least. Uh-huh. And of course, Rainer kind of came out of nowhere with Hurt Locker and has been largely left on the white side since then. Yeah. And he does great work. But anyway, so my next one up is the Cullen Brothers role for John Goodman that I did go with, <laughs> which is the role of Charlie Meadows in Barton Fink. And there's oh, another picture that's there. That's kind of an overlooked film. <laughs> it is a heavily overlooked film, but not quite as much as you would think. Barton Fink actually did have three Oscar nominations. And in fact, one of them, this is kind of an interesting oddball. One of the nominees that year was in the category that Goodman would have been in. So we'll more on that in a minute. But first of all, so basically in Barton Fink, if you're not familiar with it, it focuses on the writer, Barton Fink. He's a playwright. Goes out to L.A. to write a movie. And he is this big, snooty, I'm going to write a magnum opus <laughs> kind of write, character. And he ends up being put on a Wallace Beery wrestling picture. He doesn't know crap about wrestling. He doesn't want to. <laughs> and... His ne- his next door buddy, well, this next door guy at the hotel that he lives in, uh, is played by Charlie Meadow. Is Charlie Meadows? He's a traveling salesman, and he's very loquacious and very friendly and very okay. cheery, and he's always happy to come by and try to help <laughs> Barton. He keeps trying to help. He keeps trying, and Barton keeps looking down his nose at him. He just won all these plaudits, all these awards for pl- for making this great play about the working class man. And here's a working class man and he doesn't know how to talk to him. He doesn't know, you know. And really John Turturro almost made my list and I he his portrayal as Barton was just phenomenal. John Mahoney as well as a boozy writer who's went out to L.A. and he's like the cautionary tale, you know. Um, But Goodman did get some love. He got a Golden Globe nomination for supporting actor for this role. Now, this is one of those roles where I think it's really freaking debatable whether it was support or lead. It's really hard to say. I'm going with supporting because that's what everyone else went with. But it's real. It is a dark film. But um, and Goodman is the ray of sunshine in most of the film until the end. Uh, and then he's uh, he provides <laughs> light in a different manner. <laughs> but but at any rate, uh, he was nominated for the Golden Globe. He had two additional wins for the role and two nominations. Not a lot, but enough to show that people really noticed the role. The three Oscar nods did include one for supporting actor. Michael Lerner, as a fast-talking movie producer, took what should have been John Goodman's slot. Because, I'm sorry, Lerner was great in the role, but there's no flippin' way in hell he was better than Goodman or John Mahoney in that role. Hmm. No way in hell. The other ones that were up that year, Tommy Lee Jones for JFK, I'll give that to him. Uh, Two for Bugsy, Harvey Keitel and Ben Kingsley. I barely remember Bugsy, I I remember the performances were good. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, this was the year Jack Palance won for City Slickers. I loved him in City Slickers, but I never thought he really should have won that award. It should have gone to John Goodman, and Lerner's role probably could have gone to John Mahoney. But, I mean, they they really got things mixed up that year. (laughs) Yep. Well, Christian Bale is an individual that we know of as a muscular um, action star. 
uh, for, of course, our more Batman. and more. <laughs> and uh, but many of us don't uh, get to see. Well, we got to see a lot of his acting side, but none so much mm-hmm. as in the film, The Machinist. Oh, that was a hard one to watch. <laughs> now, you talk about something doing something for the role. Yeah. I mean, I've put up a picture of what he looked like in that role, and you've got a picture in your mind of Christian Bale. It ain't that. <laughs> he, 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 he looked like... Um, it almost was like John Goodman in this movie could have eaten a couple of them. <laughs> it was Ooh. an amazing role. Tiny. And did not get any Oscar love, which it should have. Mm-hmm. The movie itself was a very well written, very well acted mm-hmm. piece of work. It did win five awards and mm-hmm. fif- had 15 nominations, mm-hmm. and many of them actually to Bale. Uh, he had a nomination for the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy and Horror. So the Saturn Award. Yeah. yeah. Uh, European Film Award nominee. Mm-hmm. Fangoria Chainsaw Award. There's that Chainsaw Award again. Yeah. Uh, nominee. Uh, London... Eric... T- uh, the uh, London Critics Film Awards mm-hmm. nominee, uh, the Sikiza uh, Catalanian International Film Festival win. <laughs> that was his win. That was his ah. only win for that oh, role. Oh, okay. So I thought he was up for more than that because the critics raved about the role. And again, this is me. Uh, this is just what's on IMDb for. Right. And this is the reason why I specifically did not name festival and critics awards because the festival awards are very spotty. Yeah, you in never there. know. There's lots yeah. of festivals in there. Right. And I can't blame IMDb because you talk about the homework you'd have yes. to do. <laughs> yes. Uh, but during that year in 2004, uh, he would have been up against Jamie Foxx, who won for Ray. Yeah. Uh, Don Cheadle <laughs> for Hotel Rwanda. Uh, Johnny Depp for Finding Neverland. Leonardo DiCaprio for The Aviator, which we do have we do have differing opinions on that one. Mm-hmm. I felt like he was miscast for that role, mm. and I did not feel he was believable as the character. Mm. But again, we, we can... Great performance, though. We can differ on that. I still feel like he was miscast. Ah. He was very much miscast. Clint Eastwood for Million Dollar Baby. Now, I felt like Clint Eastwood's role was debatable, mm-hmm. but... Uh, that was debatable. And Hotel Rwanda, again, I felt like it was a good role, well done, but again, Christian Bale, I think, went above and beyond. Yeah. Uh, what what Clint Eastwood or Don Cheadle did, I actually felt like he even went beyond what Johnny Depp did, though Johnny Depp had an amazing That was one of his role better roles. Yes. Uh, so, but still, I feel sad that he got overlooked for that role. He was an ama- He is amazing in that, and what he did to get into that role shows it. How would you put that against the Paul Giamatti one that got snubbed? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I agree that Bale was phenomenal in that film. He really, oh, he he did a good job. And again, it's hard to watch. Oh yeah. But mm-hmm. it's yeah, he did a good job. Okay, so my next one is going to be my token vintage act, uh, role. Uh, you notice that we've mostly hewed modern. And part of that is because of familiarity with the films and familiarity with the Oscars and familiarity with what the critics were saying. The first Oscars telecast I watched most of the way through was the 99 telecast for the 98 year, you know, the Big Lebowski year. Uh, The first time I really watched it as an avid hardcore movie fan was the next year, 2000, when I I was at college and I was hanging out with some hardcore film nerds. And I had been introduced to the Coen Brothers (laughs) and Kevin Smith and some of those big names there. And... It was around 0102 that I really, 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 really got into reading critics' reviews, started following other awards to a degree, the Golden Globes, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. And then, so this was kind of where I really went from being a, 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 I don't know what's going on to, you know. 
And really, I started collecting films around 98 or so. It really wasn't even until my le- mm-hmm. near the end of high school that I started collecting movies. I didn't really start getting into movies until the early 90s. So basically... Mm-hmm. So you get so, so you see where I'm coming from. Like the older you get, the or the further back you get, the less I really have to speak from in terms mm. of familiarity. And when we do this list again in a couple of years, I will have some more vintage ones because there are a lot of roles that mm. if you tell someone it wasn't even nominated for Oscar, they will look at you like you are lying straight to their <laughs> face. Because there are some that it baffles the imagination that they weren't even nominated. Um, And even if you don't know all the ins and outs of that particular year. So this one is one that we talked a little bit on this in our Inside Movies Galore discussion on the film. This is, to my mind, one of the most iconic roles in one of the most iconic films of the 70s. It won a couple Oscars, but it was only nominated for a handful, no acting nominations at all, very little love overall, and it's a crime, really is. And I'm talking, of course, about uh, Robert Shaw's performance as Quint in the movie Jaws. Ah. That was an absolutely iconic role. You had, you know, here's your picture right there. Um, The acting in the film overall is solid. You had Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, even Murray Hamilton could have been contenders. But... As Salty Sea Dog Quint, <laughs> Shaw not only does a credible New England accent, but he he took a character who was larger than life, who really could have been a caricature, and not only managed to keep him larger than life and a big part of what mm-hmm. makes the film so fun, but he also really humanized him. The speech he gives about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, that's the kind of thing they show on awards night to show why people got nominated. You know? he yeah. That was one of the great <clears throat> speeches in movie history. Not to mention he was behind my favorite moment in the film, which again, movies galore discussion, we talk about favorite yeah. scenes. You'll remember my talking about this apart, and this is the famous part where He's talking to Hooper, and Hooper has just explained the shark cage, I believe, to Brody. And then Quint just looks at him. He's like, (laughs) you go into cage, cage go into water, shark's in the water. (laughs) Ah, shark. Farewell, and do <laughs> fair Spanish ladies. He's walking away, singing and cracking up. And it's like, I love that moment. It's a great moment and heavily spoofed moment. That wouldn't be such a heavily spoofed moment if it wasn't an iconic role. Now, Sharks in the salsa. Salsa shark. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> Sharks of the salsa. Now, I'll admit, unfortunately, I've only seen two of the awards that were uh, the nominations of this. George Burns won that year for the Sunshine Boys. This would have been yeah. in the 76 telecast. That was a pretty good one. Um, I need to see this. Uh, Brad Dourif. Oh, no, I've seen three of them. Brad Dourif was nominated for One Floor Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. Burgess Meredith for The Day of the Locust. Hmm. Never seen that. No idea what the performance was like. Uh, I have seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but I hate to say it, I can't remember what Brad Dorff did in the film. That's some solid performances. Um, so oh, they, they were solid. Chris Sarandon and Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah. Jack Warden and Shampoo. Now, I seen that. <laughs> Shampoo, I don't think Jack Warden was super special in that, but Jack Warden's Jack Warden. He's awesome. You know, I... I can't fight that too much. Sarandon was great in Dog Day Afternoon, but not a single one of those approaches the level of iconic status 
that Quint has. Not a single one. And I'm sure, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now, people still remember Jaws. They'll still remember Quint. They're going to have trouble with most of these. So, yeah. Well, my next one is... And, oh, and he did not have a single damn nomination <laughs> from any awards body. But, of course, in the 70s, there was a fraction of what there are now. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. Done? Oh, I'm done. Okay. Sorry. So, Maggie Smith. Oh. One might think that I would want to uh, bring forth uh, or bring to attention that she did not get a nomination for her uh, supporting actress role in Downton Abbey, the movie. That's a shame. Which is a shame, but that's not what I'm bringing her up for. Ah. She has quite a history, and she actually mm -hmm. has won Oscars in the past, mm -hmm. but it's been the long past. Mm -hmm. Uh. I am, of course, calling out her role as Miss Shepard in the 2015 oh, film The Lady in the Van. That was an interesting role. She plays the role of a, an older woman who is, of course, having some issues <laughs> of her own. Mm -hmm. And, of course, lives out of her van. Hmm. This film did get one win and six nominations. She was nominated for the Golden Globe. She had a BAFTA nomination. Hmm. Uh, she did win, so she got the film's one win, for the Evening Standard British Film Awards. Hmm. She uh, was nominated for the Women's Film Critics Circle Awards. And this was a strong role for her. I thought this was an incredible role, the way mm -hmm. that she played it. And this film did have some talk. It did have buzz around it mm -hmm. at the time. A little bit. Yeah, it wasn't a lot. It was enough to get you thinking, well, maybe I should take a look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, but the winner for that year was Brie Larson for Room. I mm -hmm. still haven't seen it. Oh, she's great. I mean, my uh, my most recent experience with Brie Larson is Captain Marvel, but I assume it's a better role than that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kate Blanchett for Carol. Jennifer Lawrence for Joy. Charlotte Rampling for 45 Years. And Circe Ronan for Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I have not seen any of these films. I've seen all of them. <laughs> but I feel like Maggie Smith did deserve a fighting chance that year. At least for a nomination. Alright. So, I mean, shoot. I almost saw Brooklyn. You should. Oh, I should see a lot of films. <laughs> <laughs> no, you really should. I, lo I loved Brooklyn. I really did. And actually, it's really funny you should say that because my next pick is my pick for the snub for Best Actress for that year. Oh, well. <laughs> so, in a year that featured Brie Larson for Room, Kate Blanchett for Carol, Charlotte <laughs> Rampling for 45 Years, Jennifer Lawrence for Joy, and Saoirse Ronan for Brooklyn, the role that I'm looking for is the role of Kumiko, played by Rum oh, yes. Rinko Kikuchi in the film Kumiko, the Treasure Hunter. <laughs> Unlike Lady in the Van, this was a movie almost no one heard of. Uh, and like Lady in the Van, it did not get nearly the buzz it should have. And Kikuchi is flat out phenomenal. This is a film by the <laughs> Zellner brothers, David and Nathan Zellner. And it's based on an urban legend. It Basically, there is an urban legend revolving around the Coen Brothers film Fargo, which is a phenomenal film. Um, and the legend goes like this. There was a Japanese woman who was found dead in a snowbank in Minnesota. And the legend grew up around it that she had seen Fargo and went to Minnesota looking for the buried money. Turns out that she was an office worker with suicidal tendencies and had there was more involved to, to than that. The Zellner brothers decided to take that basic premise and actually make a fairy tale. Hmm. But it's a it's a weird film. I need to it see it. It starts yeah. off you would hate the first half. Hopefully you can make it through the first half. <laughs> because basically she is a woman who's lost all interest in life. Everything is tedious. Everything is dull. Everything is boring. And the film puts you in her shoes. Ah. So for the first half of the film, well, first third-ish, 
you basically see her day-to-day -day life as a board office worker and you could think of it as a documentary about being a board office worker. <laughs> but then she discovers, in a cave of all things, a copy of the VHS for Fargo. Ah. And she starts making plans. And eventually she makes it to Minnesota. She, fe she meets, this was actually apparently based on a real event. She meets a sympathetic police officer who cannot communicate with her at all. <laughs> and he tries to, you know, but she ends up eventually going out on her own. And I won't tell you how it ends, except that, again, this one hews much closer to the fairy tale, the urban legend, than the reality. But Kikuchi is phenomenal. It's a hybrid role, mostly Japanese, but a little bit of English. And she just does such a great job. And she is vastly overdue for another Oscar nomination. She remains, I believe, the only Japanese actress, national, Japanese national actress nominated. Hmm. No, I think there's two. I think there's two. But she remains one of the only ones, and the most recent one by far. She really deserved more work. Now, I will admit, Maggie Smith's role was great, and I had not considered it. And it was hard enough for me to take one off the list. But now that you mention that, Smith probably deserved it as much or more than some of these. Like I said, I've seen all of them. Brie Larson is phenomenal phenomenal in room I would not not take that away from her Saoirse Ronan is phenomenal in Brooklyn Jennifer Lawrence is not as great as she could be in Joy but she carries that film from start to finish and she is a hoot to watch it was a fun film even if it went off the rails which it did that pretty much leaves Kate Blanchett and Charlotte Rampling. They both give great performances, solid performances. I think that was Rampling's first ever performance that was nominated. So I hate to take that from her. So maybe it would have to be Kate Blanchett. I, I keep picking on Kate Blanchett, but <laughs> I love her. But she's been up for several awards. But Kikuchi definitely should have been a nominee and I would not have miss, been upset if Smith was mm -hmm. she did she did get a nomination for the Independent Spirit Award and she won one additional nomination that was it like I said the film was a festival darling so it probably had some festival wins but yeah <laughs> well this next one I'm pretty sure you would agree with me on okay uh, much like Jim Carrey who was kind of boxed into certain types of roles, this kinda. actor worked towards breaking free. Mm -hmm. And it is debatable whether he truly got the love he deserved in yeah. his breaking with convention. Now, mm -hmm. there are many roles that he had done later on that were off the beaten path. Mm -hmm. But this one, I believe, was the most intense. And of course, I'm talking about Robin Williams and One Hour Photo. <laughs> now... Uh, okay, I had to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Inconceivable! <laughs> well, okay. so, well, you go ahead. So I guess you would agree with me <laughs> yes. on this particular one. <laughs> All right, well, well. So there you go. <laughs> At least I know that you that you are in agreement then. Uh, for playing Seymour Parrish for the 2002 mm -hmm. film. Yeah, the film won six awards and was mm -hmm. nominated for 22. Mm -hmm. Including the AARP movies for Grown Ups. He mm -hmm. got nominated for his role for that. Mm -hmm. He won a Saturn for mm -hmm. it. And I had to go on the other page. Mm -hmm. uh, had a nomination for Golden Satellite. Mm -hmm. He had uh, a nomination for the DFWC mm -hmm. DFWFCA. <laughs> he was nominated for Critics' Choice Awards, for the Golden Schmoes, and the SEMA Awards. Mm -hmm. But he did win the Chainsaw Award. Yep. See, these people know quality. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I had him listed for the Saturn Award and one additional win with eight total additional nominations. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> See, that Chainsaw Award. Yeah. They know something. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had quite a um, he had quite competition that year. Of course, Adrian mm -hmm. Brody won for The Pianist. Mm -hmm. uh, but also there was Nicolas Cage for Adaptation, which was probably one of Cage's best performances. Two. Yeah. <laughs> Two of his best performances. <laughs> and uh, it just really was an amazing mm -hmm. performance for mm -hmm. Cage. Uh, Michael Caine for The Quiet American. Mm -hmm. Daniel Day-Lewis for Gangs of New York, mm -hmm. which I do believe, which would be my pick for the one knockoff for this one. Mm. I did not care for Gangs of New York. Mm. Uh, and Jack Nicholson for About Smith, which many people might also kick well, him off, but I would consider that one of Jack Nicholson's stronger roles. Apparently Oscar had a bit of buyer's remorse with Gangs of New York. Ten nominations, they didn't give it a single award. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. Gangs of New York was a lot of, was a lot of visual mastery, uh -huh. but I did not feel like there was a lot of there. I liked there. his performance, but I'm not sure that it was nearly on the same level. Not on the same level as this performance which that's weird to say that of daniel day lewis dude is known for taking it to another level <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right you go so, for it oh, okay so <clears throat> yes um i'm going to follow up a little bit so again and i have my own picture to show with uh but mine was also i actually was going to do a twofer and for the life of me i could not find the second film and i don't I actually thought that Robin Williams was horribly overlooked as a double nominee that mm -hmm. year. He could also have had a nod in supporting role for his role as Walter Finch oh, in yeah. Insomnia. He was a great role, which essential in in, in 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 and I'll mention that Insomnia had almost no love. He got a nomination for the Saturn Award for that one. <laughs> he was a double nominee with the Saturn mm -hmm. Awards, and he had one additional nomination for that, and that was it. Insomnia. Most people overlooked that role. Oh no, in, yeah, it was... and it was a triple threat year. Yeah. I read a, a critic's review of One Hour Photo, where they were talking about people who get trapped into like really bad family films mm -hmm. and whatever and they have to do a sort of they described it as a sort of atonement and for, for robin williams that means going dark really dark that would have been because this smoochy. was well this was the <laughs> third one that year the first yeah. one was death to smoochie which i think was like february yeah and then in like april he did insomnia and then like in august i think was when one hour photo came out and yes, he went dark that oh, year. Did. And he did get a Razzie nod for uh, Death to Smoothie. Yeah, yes. But Williams is, was, he, the man yeah. will be missed, he was a great actor. Mm -hmm. He was not just a great comedian or a big old goofball like some people think he was. And that was, I think, one of the things that hurt him with these roles was he was so His dark. Reputation. And mm -hmm. not just dark, but he was restrained he was subdued mm -hmm. this character is the guy that you would not know to, you would not know him from adam unless you happen to be the family he is fixated on <laughs> because he's too friendly to them but he still he doesn't cross a line really that they know of until he the family does something someone in the family betrays his trust and then he goes all psycho and you know but yeah. even then he doesn't go blah, 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 you know he actually comes off very i mean again mm -hmm. you your mental health thing you yeah. can i would say he does a very convincing sociopath he he's a very um one of the best moments in any horror film ever is when you've been introduced to him as this quiet guy, this very respectable guy. Mm -hmm. He does his job. He does it well. He gets irritated mm -hmm. at the people that don't. He's very friendly to this family. Just a little too friendly, you know. And then you see him sitting at home, watching TV. He's all alone. He looks really sad. You think, oh man, this guy is so sad. And then the camera pans back. And you see his entire wall is wallpapered with the pictures of this family and that to me that was one of the best shots in oh, any yeah. horror film ever it was like holy crap <laughs> but he really deserved it and in insomnia 
he plays a writer who may or may not be involved with the disappearance of a local girl. And the dogged detective played in this version by Al Pacino mm -hmm. figures out very quickly that he probably knows more than he's telling. <laughs> But one of the great things I think that makes Chris Nolan's Insomnia even better than the original is Walter Finch. Williams oh, yeah. play in the original, he plays him as this you're never gonna catch me. Like he doesn't he's not quite like, yeah, you never catch me, copper, that sort of thing. <laughs> but he's like he's very confident and assured of you're not going to lay a finger on me. Williams plays the character as he's almost trying to convince himself he's innocent. Yeah. And I just love that. I thought it was so yeah. good. It's sort um, of like uh, just... Um, and there's always these kind of people that right. play it as, and, you know, I didn't mean to do this, right. but, you know, just right. like the, the temper got away from him, and the, he himself knows he's guilty, right. and he feels guilty, right. and he's conflicted. And... But... Mm -hmm. He is so much on self-preservation, and focuses so much on that, right. that he ends up deluding himself into saying that it's not my fault, it's her fault. Right. And that's where it comes into play. It was, like I said, they were both great roles. Mm -hmm. I had also considered that one, mm -hmm. but one, you know, one role, one part, one, right. one list item. So I kind of like, cheated because it was the back. same year, you <laughs> yeah. know? But, um, and I will say as well, we talked a little bit about lead acting. I will say of the bunch, I would almost go with Jack Nicholson in About Schmidt or Michael Caine in The Quiet American as the one that should have gotten bumped. Maybe Daniel Day-Lewis. I definitely would say Brody and Cage deserve those nods. Absolutely. Now, in the supporting role, I just love the performances in general in Adaptation. And I loved Chris Cooper's performance, and he was horribly overlooked for so long that I was cheering for him to win. But I honestly kind of almost thought that Christopher Walken and Catch Me If You Can and Paul Newman in Road to Perdition were just as good. Mm -hmm. Which leaves two roles, Ed Harris for The Hours and John C. Riley for Chicago. Now, I think it's awesome that Riley got an Oscar nomination. He is usually thought of as a comedic goofball. Yeah. And his one shining moment in Chicago is the song Mr. Cellophane. And it is, to me, it's the one of the best moments in mm -hmm. the film. And he nails it. But I kind of don't really like giving a nod to someone mainly because of one musical performance. <laughs> he has more screen time, and he does great throughout. And then Ed Harris basically plays the friend dying of AIDS. Um, the hours, once again, chock full of awesome performances. Yeah. But And Ed Harris is awesome. But either one of those roles could have made way for this Robin Williams role... I would be less upset if he had snagged the best actor nod, but I still think it would have been so cool if he'd gotten a double nod, you yeah. know. But anyway. Well, now we're on to honorable mentions. Honorable mentions, yes. And you had said that we should talk about just an ensemble, uh, a just basically a movie that's more of an ensemble piece. Well, that wasn't exactly what I meant, but if that's where you went, that's a good way to do it. So... I was looking through things that I thought were really good ensemble mm -hmm. movies, where everybody did a good job. And Oscar has a really bad track record for actually awarding these films, so yeah. So, this is a film that got snubbed this year, mm -hmm. and I've already mentioned it. But I felt like it's stronger as an ensemble mm -hmm. than it is as an individual piece. Mm -hmm. And this is... Downton Abbey, oh. the movie. Oh, you got the fancy one. Well, yeah. Ooh. Well, this is not my edition. This is my wife. Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> yeah, okay. I got this for her for Christmas. And oh. it is a beautiful edition. Oh, yeah. And it was a beautiful movie. And this film would not have worked mm -hmm. so well without this cast right. working together in concert, which they've had so long to do. They've been on the show right. for ages. But... They work so well together. They play so well off one another. Mm -hmm. It just was, to me, perfection, if you mm -hmm. talk about ensembles. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do have notes on it. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so it did hit some... No it's already had nominees. And mm -hmm. it's already had one win. 
Mm -hmm. The Hollywood Film Awards it got costume design. Oh. Which yeah. it really got snubbed by Oscar for costume design. And it also won the Artisan Award uh, for the Hollywood Film Awards for Best Period uh, best yeah. period uh, Character Hairstyle and Makeup. Huh. Well, the makeup, it got the nomination, but it got the hairstyling win. Hmm. But it also has uh, SDFCS nominations for Best Costume Design, Production Design, Best Ensemble, uh, the Satellite Awards for Best Costume Design, Seattle Film Critics Awards for Best Costume Design. You see a pattern here, right? Uh, Again, Oscar, uh, you done <laughs> dropped the ball on that and Production Design, both of those. Uh, as uh, The Critics' Choice Awards, Production Design and Costume Design. CDG Award, Excellent in Period Film, EDA Special Mention, Actress Defying Age and Ageism for Maggie Smith, mm. and the AARP Movies for Grown Ups. <laughs> I know it's a weird name. <laughs> no, I just think it's funny mm. that there was the one about award for a uh, anti ageism because yeah. Maggie Smith herself says that Lady Grantham should have died yes. years ago. <laughs> but you know, supporting actress. Maggie Smith, <laughs> Best Ensemble, and Reader's Choice. Ah. So, again, it's got the potential for a rich awards history. Several of these I don't think have happened yet, hmm. but um, still, it's got a lot of nominations. It's got at least one, it's got a couple of wins, mm -hmm. and it was a heavy snub this year. Hmm. So, good ensemble, good overall, hmm. good job. Too bad you were ignored. <laughs> yeah. You see, I um and again, you know, as per usual, I, I try to we discuss these things ahead of times and I don't always think about hitting every single point. And one of my points was sticking to the existing categories. I think there should be an Oscar for Best Ensemble Casting. There really needs to be one. Because you do have these movies with these huge casts. And you got to give them some love. And you can't do it all the time. So what I was actually thinking was, I'm looking at a group of films. Broadly speaking, the Academy has a... Piss poor history. A terrible, terrible track record when it comes to nominating actors in foreign language films. They almost never do. If you're in a foreign language film, you can forget an Oscar nomination for acting. See? Parasite. Actually, Parasite would be mm. another great one for ensemble acting because they're all so good. But... They should have had some multiple nominations for that movie. Especially supporting actress uh, for multiple ones. And much as I love Scarlett Johansson, she could have given up that role. And there's a couple of the actors. Uh, one in particular should have been in the acting, you know. But the one that this time around I went ahead and let into mine was Lust Caution. And I will mention again that in addition to Wei Tang... Uh, Joan Chen and Tony Leung are both, uh, they have multiple awards. <laughs> there goes. Uh, another one, uh, In the Mood for Love, Tony Leung and Maggie Chang. Uh, you've got the ensemble of youngsters in the film City of God, which was phenomenal acting all around. Um, and this year sees the first ever nomination from international superstar Antonio Banderas. He got lucky. He got a film filmed in his own language with his old buddy Pedro Almodovar, his frequent companion on film and Almodovar's frequent companion on film, Penelope Cruz. Cruz is not up for an Oscar. She has an Oscar history, including for an Almodovar film, Volver. Uh, you had Marion Cotillard's win for La Vie en Rose. You have the Gerard de Puggio has a handful of nominations. There are exceptions, but they are very rare, and they are almost always Antonio Banderas, Marion Cotillard, Penelope Cruz, Ken Watanabe, Gerard de Puggio, Isabel Ajani, uh, Isabel Hooper, international stars who are either the star of their film, or you cannot forget that role. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And they're usually in American-produced films. Cruz in Vicky Cristina Barcelona, Watanabe in The Last Samurai, Hang Yo for The Killing Fields, you know, things like that. Pat Morita for The Karate Kid. You know, you get people who, you know, you're international and and then foreign uh, born and whatever get them in an American film they might have a shot Rinko Kikuchi was for an international production mm -hmm. by a Mexican director but it starred Brad Pitt and mm -hmm. Kate Blanchett you know Adriana Barraza also got her nomination for that role Roma was the major exception it was a Mexican production through and through but on Netflix an American company <laughs> So, it's just, Pan's Labyrinth should have been up for acting. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon should have been up for acting. There were a lot of movies that should have been up for acting, and they weren't because they were foreign language films. And honestly, I'm, that is the main reason. I'm going to say that is the main reason. Oscar needs to get better at this. Big time. And as we do this... Uh, list in the future i have a lot of these people i could talk about and i'll probably do one or two per list but there's just so many it's hard to know where to start <laughs> yeah so so number one oh well. <laughs> so we talk about iconic roles uh-huh uh, so, and some of these roles, such as uh, Captain Jack Sparrow, are actually uh, rewarded by Oscar. Mm -hmm. Or uh, some even win, like mm -hmm. Heath Ledger for The Joker. Mm -hmm. But some are still overlooked. Sometimes the role is even bigger than the actor or the acting job itself. Mm. And this is an example of a role that mm -hmm. is larger than life. Mm -hmm. Now we are talking about Bruce Campbell for his character <laughs> yes. Ash and I have picked Army of Darkness <laughs> as the particular film <laughs> to give that to because none of the movies had the character more prominent than Army of Darkness. The one could, agree, one could say that the character was formed in the original films. Yeah, but it his was, performance got better with each film, yes. too. His performance in so, this one was great. As far as things go in the Evil Dead trilogy, I felt like this was my favorite of it, and I still consider his role uh, as Ash my favorite. It actually had... The film had ten wins and mm. seven nominations, and he did get one win for his acting and for, for the character of Ash, which is the Chainsaw Awards, which, you know... Uh, I have a lot of respect for uh, as we've gone through because they seem to agree with me on many of these <laughs> areas. Um, well, he actually had a chainsaw, so that made a little more sense. It was like, this dude getting a chainsaw award's kind of funny. <laughs> so this is uh, 1992. Uh -huh. So that was a hard year for him to beat because we have some ones that I could not yeah. kick off. I mean, Al Pacino won for Scent of a Woman. I really couldn't kick him off for that. He was good. Robert Downey Jr. was up for Chaplin again. That was an extremely powerful performance mm -hmm. for him uh, during a time of... That was during a time of turbulence for him, yeah. I believe. Uh, Clint Eastwood for The Unforgiven. A lot of people say that was his best role of it. I disagree with that. That's one that I would kick off for that. Mm. Um, I felt like he did much better roles playing similar characters in other movies. Mm. And I think the supporting cast did much better than he did. Mm. But th that's just my th my thoughts on it. Uh, Stephen Rea, uh, which I butchered the name, uh, for The Crying Game. Uh, which I can't really say I haven't seen The Crying Game. I've seen it, but I barely remember it. And of course another one, Denzel Washington from Malcolm X. So really and truly, it's only those two movies that Clint Eastwood and Stephen Rea, which I haven't seen the second one, so I would have kicked Clint Eastwood off. To put Bruce Campbell on at that point. He deserved it. The character is an icon. Still is an icon. If you haven't watched Ash vs. Evil Dead, you should. And uh, just in general, awesome character. 
Good times. Done deal. So my last one, I'm once again doing two roles, but this time it's the same actress, same film. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but this is um, one that definitely I don't think anyone would would debate. In fact, in research for this, I found several lists, and some of them featured some of the characters I've mentioned. A lot of them mentioned the dude, and some of them will mention Quint, and, you know, some of these, you know, Phil Connors, some of these are really beloved roles. I don't think I saw Ash on any of the lists, but, you know, they, <laughs> I just might not have been looking in the right place. But one that's pretty much ubiquitous. There were a couple that were pretty much ubiquitous. And I made a point not to put too many of them on this list because mm -hmm. I wanted to mix it up. And I didn't want this to be all what you would see every time you look up one of these lists. And I think between us, we did a good job of oh, not yeah. doing that. <laughs> Definitely off the beaten path. <laughs> but this one I have always maintained from the moment... I walked out of the theater, I was like, holy crap, I love this woman, she's so awesome, I can't wait to see, you know, what she does, and I was on board from the get-go, and when she didn't even get a nomination, I was, I couldn't believe it, and then when the award didn't even go to the best person who was nominated. It was like, it was just doubly insulting. I'm speaking, of course, of the dual roles of Betty and Diane Selwyn in the film Mulholland Drive. And Naomi Watts is the actress. I've got pictures of both roles here. Um... Mulholland Drive is a friggin' fever dream from David Lynch. <laughs> it is one of the most fascinating backstories, I think. He started it as a TV pilot, and it wasn't picked up, so he recut it, re-edited it, and turned it into a movie that did all right when it came out. It made a little bit of box office. It made a lot of critics' lists. But even then, people liked it. And over the years, they've come to love it. This has become the most critically acclaimed film of the past couple of decades, according to certain sites I've seen. And again, Naomi Watts is on every one of these lists. If you look them up, she was so... It was a star-making turn. But unless you saw Mulholland Drive, you were introduced to her by the ring. <laughs> so, but still, those two movies pretty much put her on the map. Yep. She has had a very sad Oscar history. She's only been up twice. I actually think she was gypped when she wasn't nominated for Birdman. But she was really gypped with this one. And it, it, going into the awards, she won... A National Board of Review Award for Breakthrough Performance. She was nominated for the Saturn Award and the AFI Award. She had 11 additional wins and 7 additional nominations. She was considered a frontrunner going into the race. And come nomination day, not only she, but the entire movie got gypped. David Lynch got a sole nod for Best Director. What sense does that make? You give mm -hmm. the director a nomination for the, being the best director of the year, but nothing else in the movie was worthy of a nomination. It made no sense. And then you had the actual awards history. Actress ended up going to Halle Berry for Monsters Ball, which was an historic win, and coming on the same night... The Denzel won, and Sidney Poitier got a Lifetime Award. I can see why they went that route. But I'm sorry, between Halle Berry and Monsters Ball and Judy Dench and Iris, Judy acted circles around Halle Berry. Judy Dench's performance was the best of her career, and she has had a hella career. So they not only left Naomi Watts out in the cold, but they didn't even give the award to the best person. <laughs> you also had, and this was where it got even more insulting. Well, not yet, because Sissy Spacek's uh, nomination for In the Bedroom, that's fine. She's great in that film. 
I love Renee Zellweger and Bridget Jones' Diary, but I'm sorry, it's not even on the same level. <laughs> and Nicole Kidman for Moulin Freaking Rouge? Give me a goddamn break. That was one of the worst choices for Best Actress that I can think of. I like Nicole Kidman, and she has done some great work. A lot of people think she was snubbed this year for Bombshell, and I don't totally disagree. I think she's had roles that she deserved a nomination. She kind of maybe deserved her win for the hours, but she did not deserve a nomination for Moulin Rouge. So those three things, not even nominating Naomi Watts, nominating <laughs> Nicole Kidman's role in Moulin Rouge in place of her, and giving it to Halle Berry when there was a more deserving nominee, all those things, they just really buggered it up that year. That Honestly, that could go on the list yeah. for next week if I'm not covering it right now. That was one of the worst muck-ups in Oscar history. They really, really messed up yeah. and uh, yeah so that's my number one even though it's on every one of these lists i wanted to include it because <laughs> i agree wholeheartedly with this but anyway so like i said that's our brief t intro brief. <laughs> <laughs> well considering what i wanted to do <laughs> i kid you not well, i'll show you a very quick visual Oh, you want to do all of those. These are my notes. <laughs> so and this ten is years no, later. <laughs> this is nowhere near a complete list. Nowhere near. Um, <laughs> and it's gone. Forever. And it's gone, yes. But, uh... <laughs> And, you know, again, you'll, you'll, as we go on this season, you'll hear us rant plenty about the people that got left oh, out yeah. this year. The Ana de, Ana de Armas, the Jennifer Lopez, the entire cast of Parasite, Maggie Smith, I kind yeah. of agree with. Um, yeah, it's just... So, if Oscars would go ahead and implement an ensemble category, yeah. and vocal acting categories, and uh, best bit player cameo, well, that would solve a lot of problems. Yeah. Yeah? But, uh... <laughs> get more actors there, do. You know? But, anyway, hope, man, I hope you had fun. Did you have any more closing thoughts, or...? Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. But, of course, yeah. if you like what you've seen, yeah. hit that like button, subscribe, yeah. and share. We're going to be very active during Oscar season yeah. with our next one about, uh, we're, as we as a compilation, right. where we've actually discussed these, uh, ten times Oscars messed up. They and they, as we just said, they have. And that's that's <laughs> that that in itself is an ongoing list. Yes, and uh, we'll probably have a couple to add to it after this year. Yep. But um, and of course, uh, after we get through the Oscar season, we'll get our top tens for mm -hmm. the year because, as it is, mm -hmm. we're ever evolving, and uh, when it comes to what mm -hmm. we've seen. And we've shown in this list that we are still dreadfully behind. And also, I definitely <laughs> want to say, you know, we definitely want to extend the invite as usual. If you have specific ones that we overlooked or specific ones that you really agree or disagree with that we included, <laughs> by all means, let us know. I'd love to hear some additional... Uh, Support so Sid Hey. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll admit this. I would be furious if that had been a nominee because then I'd have to watch it. <laughs> but on the other hand, I would think it's hilarious. So, you, know, you know, it's kind of that little that mixed bag there, you know? it's Which one do I want more, to be entertained now with the nominations? Or... <laughs> Uh, and yeah, seeing uh, Bruce Campbell <laughs> nominated for anything would just make my day right oh, yeah. there. I mean, <laughs> See, I'm sure he would agree. <laughs> well, uh, with that being said, mm -hmm. we've gone on for a while, mm -hmm. so we will see you on the next one. Goodbye. Right. Goodbye.